Greetings to you all who have joined us from across Zimbabwe, the region, the continent, and all corners of, of the world to this policy dialogue, Surface Trust Policy Dialogue. Today we are looking at elections again in Zimbabwe in the context of a comparison with the Malawi and Zambia, but also informed by the South Africa from where our moderator comes from, and I'll introduce us shortly. The topic today is, are the necessary conditions in place for free and fair elections in Zimbabwe in 2023? We've been, this is the second discussion on elections, and there will be several other sessions as we move towards elections in 2023. Uh, but today really is to consider in the context of a very rough backdrop of untidy elections ever since independence, but particularly so since 2000, a period punctuated by very violent elections and highly disputed outcomes. And, so, and therefore to help us discuss today, we have as moderator, Pansy Tlakula, who's currently the chairperson of the Information Regulator of South Africa. Uh, it's a newly established statutory body responsible for monitoring and enforcement of the right of access to information and the right to privacy as it relates to the protection of personal information. She's also a member of the United Nations Committee on the elimination of racial discrimination. Pansy's career is one that helps to inform this discussion. She has occupied leadership positions in independent constitutional bodies nationally and on the African continent. These positions include the following, among many, among many others. Chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights from 2015-2017, Commissioner of the ACHPR, SS, ACHPR from 2005-2017, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, Chairperson, significantly Chairperson of the Electoral Commission of South Africa from 2011-2014, 
In 2006, she was part of the team that assisted the DRC, Congo, with its first democratic elections in 40 years. In 2006, she was a member of the African Union team of election experts who developed sustainable electoral practices in Africa through the establishment of the African Union Electoral Assistance Unit. In 2007, she was appointed by the United Nations Development Program as one of the international technical advisors to the Independent National Electoral Commission of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for the 2007 presidential elections. And in 2009, she was invited by the Commonwealth Secretariat to a working meeting of experts to conceptualize the establishment of the Commonwealth Community of Election Management Bodies, now known as Commonwealth Electoral Network, and many others. But as I said earlier, Francis' background renders her most suitable to moderate this discussion on a very turbulent period in our history of elections in Zimbabwe in particular, but also on the continent. We have in August this year, Zambian elections, and we already see elements of that which we are complaining about in Zimbabwe. But we also have the president of Malawi, the TIPEX elections, and the power of the public opinion civic society in particular in overturning not only shoddy elections, but overturning and Malawi in overthrowing dictatorships. So now, Pansy, welcome. Save uh, Pansy time, uh, I'd like to introduce the other panelists. Uh, our main presenter this evening is Zikamai Bere. One of our young Turks in Zimbabwe, a brilliant lawyer, is a human rights activist and country national director of the Zimbabwe Human Rights Association, Zim Rights, which has a grassroots membership of over 250,000 members across Zimbabwe. He's coming from a massive constituency, Zikamai. We have also, to his CV, his latest publication in a book entitled Building Democracy or Judicialization Lessons from Africa's Emerging Electoral Jurisprudence. And this chapter is entitled Pre Electoral Period Election, Environment, Law, and Practice for Restoring the Promise of African Elections. Next, Zikamai, more than suitable to be our lead panelist in this discussion. And to assist uh, Zikamai, we have from Zambia, Laura Miti, Executive Director of Alliance for Community Action, uh, ACA, which works for the empowerment of the public to routinely ask difficult questions in demanding accountability on the part of public officials. And in particular, to empower Zambian citizens to make elections an, an accountability event. This has been Laura's lifelong working career, calling for accountability in governance. She's the columnist in Zambian and South African uh, newspapers. Welcome, Laura. Then the other panelist is Gift Chapins from Malawi, a graduate of the University of Malawi, chairperson of the Human Rights Defenders Coalition, a key body in the mobilization of citizens in the famous Tibex election uh, in Malawi, and also in challenging a lockdown which was not only propagated without following uh, the law, but it was in, implicitly meant to try and frustrate the, the elections. As discussions, we have Ellen Dingani, program coordinator from the Zimbabwe Election Super, Super Support Network, ZESEN. And, and uh, ZESEN is a very important body in Zimbabwe. 
um, and Ellen is at the heart of it. That's this is back from Zimbabwe. Then we have Ngei Kanyongolo from Malawi, a lawyer, lecturer at the law in the University of Malawi, and one who was very involved in the election debacle in Malawi recently. Then we have Neo Simutani, your colleague we have met before in Sapis Fora. He's the reserve director for the Center for Policy Dialogue in Zambia. So that's our team. And with that, I hand over to our moderator, Pansy Lakula, advocate Pansy Lakula. Welcome, Pansy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, my brother, Dr. Ibo Mandaza, for inviting me to moderate this very important uh, webinar at this point in time, really, in uh, the history of most of our countries and the, the history of the world, because we have had challenges on the African continent insofar as um, the freeness and fairness of the elections is concerned. And now we, we are confronted over and above the challenges that we have by having to manage an election in a pandemic that on its own brings in its own unique challenges. Having been uh, an election manager for, for many years, I always say to people that, you know, uh, in that space, once we've been there, nothing, nothing frightens you. If you have managed elections, I say to people, look, I'm not scared of anything because I have managed elections in my lifetime. And people, when they look at issues of the freeness and fairness of election, I, and I think people who are not involved closely with the process, they kind of look at very superficial issues uh, starting on election day and so on. And yet, the foundation of a, a free and fair election starts with a constitutional framework. If you get that wrong, then you can never get anything else right. And that's where it starts. Then with that, it starts with the appointment of the election management body, how transparent is it, uh, and so forth and so on. The people who are in this panel would know about it, that if you want to rig an election, you rig it long, long before election day. On election day, everything else will have done, been done because you look at issues of how the boundaries are drawn, how transparent is that process, what is the formula. You look at many other issues that I will not go into detail. So on election day, you find people coming to say they observe elections. You know, I just think that, and maybe I shouldn't say this uh, because uh, I think there is utility in observe uh, or election observation. But my other side, cynical side of me as an older person is that, look, um, by the time observers come, the election would have been long time um, rigged. If even the long-term observers, if they are not there during the time of lawmaking, then everything else becomes difficult. With that, with those few remarks, I will then invite the first speaker, my brother, Ndiga Maibere. You have 25 minutes. Um, we are almost, it, it's 1745, 42. When you see me appearing, I'm going to mute my camera. When you see me appearing, uh, switching on my camera, you must know that you have two minutes left. Over to you, Zingamai. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the, to, the, to the conveners of this meeting. Uh, I think this is a very timely conversation. I would like to ask for permission to share my screen. Um, let me see if uh, let me see if the technology 
allows it. Just to confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. All right. So, yeah, so I have been asked to trigger the conversation tonight, which is focusing on um, uh, the necessary conditions in place for free and fair elections in Zimbabwe in 2023. Um, so I have uh, about 20 minutes and my task is a simple one. It's actually not to answer the question but to at least to trigger the conversation so that we can reflect together. So I expect in the next, uh, in the next 20 or so minutes um, uh, to cover the following areas, to at least share the context within which uh, the 2023 election is coming. Um, and since the question asks about the conditions, at least to throw some light around uh, what are those conditions? What is it that we are looking for? Um, I will move into the prognosis. Um, what does 2023 look like if the current conditions do not change? And uh, make some suggestions on how do we deal with those challenges? But also reflect on what it stands in the way of us achieving um, the conditions that we need for free and fair elections. Um, and then I will conclude with some reflections on the myths and truths related to, to elections. So beginning with, uh, with the context um, in which we are holding these elections, uh, as Dr. Mandaza has, has mentioned, basically my background is one of grassroots. I, I'm coming from a grassroots organization. And the way that I look at the context is generally influenced um, by that background. And I, th I think there are basically about four key aspects that I want to highlight uh, into this context for us to be able to reflect on are there necessary conditions in place for free and fair elections in Zimbabwe. Um, the first uh, issue that I want to highlight is the fact that uh, the 2023 20, election are coming um, in the backdrop of a post coup military government. So the government that came into power in 2017 through a military coup is the government in power today. Um, what does that mean for elections? Um, and we have an idea of what that means for elections because we've got precedents. The 2018 elections give us an idea of how our government, the 2018 elections give us an idea of how the current government in place treats elections. Um, the memories of the 2018 post-election violence are still fresh. We do have the Montlande report um, where it has been acknowledged and documented and confirmed of people who were shot in broad daylight and killed. Um, so that's part of our context. And it is a context that brings to the surface um, a very dominant security sector in our country. Um, so, and we have seen that in action, the period between now um, and the previous elections, wherein each time um, there was uh, an attempt to exercise uh, uh, fundamental freedoms, either by demonstrating uh, the military has had to respond there have been accusations that the, the police has been militarized. Um, and we have documented a number 
um, uh, of, uh, of, of violations uh, between the, the last election and, and currently, which tells you of the security sector dominance in, in the current affairs. Now you add that the cartel power dynamics. So there was a recent, there was a report that was released on, on cartel power dynamics, uh, which was released by, um, uh, uh, by the Daily Maverick, by the Maverick Citizen. And when, when you read that report, you understand um, the power uh, of cartel dynamics in this country um, and how there has been a huge investment in political processes in Zimbabwe and how business, the, the cartels uh, are locked within the politics of this country. And this speaks to the power of money in determining a political process. Now, when you look at this and many other aspects of the context in which we are, then you can begin to have an idea of what kind of an election. It is election for sale. It is justice for sale. And it is violence for sale because where the money goes, the violence follows and the power follows. And that's the first aspect of the context that we are dealing with. The second aspect that we are dealing with that I want to make reference to is the decimation of the opposition. So between the last election and the current ele and the next election, uh, the, the, the most outstanding thing in our context has been the devastating effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. But within that pandemic, we have seen um, the decimation of the opposition, uh, starting off with um, uh, the infamous Supreme Court judgment uh, that dethroned Nelson Chamisa uh, in a way. We saw the inauguration of Douglas Monzora, um, effectively the capture uh, of the opposition, wherein the government decides to install its own uh, opposition. Uh, leading to the capture even of opposition properties, uh, parliamentary recalls, and the decimation of the constitution. This is the context in which we are looking for free and fair elections in 20, 2013. Then the third aspect is, of course, judicial capture. We have seen the most contested aspect of amendment bill number two, which was passed um, early last month um, has been the judicial capture by the executive. So there are many things within that amendment bill, but at least what is outstanding is the fact that the government is determined, at least the executive is determined to have a judiciary of its own choice ahead of the 2023 elections. And now they have appointed new judges to the constitutional court and to the Supreme Court. Now, when the state of a judiciary becomes part of a ruling political party's election strategy, then you can have an idea of what kind of an election that we are, we are, we are going into. And finally, in the context is the aspect of authoritarian consolidation. Um, I have spoken about the decimation of the constitution uh, the suspension of elections. Uh, we have the pending Patriot Act, NGO bill. And now the Minister uh, of Youth, uh, uh, Olympic gold medalist, Kirsty Coventry, has now inaugurated the infamous National Youth Service. Hence, slowly putting together the aspects that form um, the architecture of violence in this country. And we've got evidence of the devastating uh, power of the National Youth Service uh, from previous elections. So that's the context that we are dealing with. Now, from that context, we would want to try and envision from there, what does a free and fair election look like? Um, and is it really, really possible? Um, so in this envisioning process, uh, 
I think we are led to the to the standards, and I think the the, the golden standard for what are those conditions we find that in the uh, uh, in the in the international covenant on civil and political rights, you know, international covenant uh, on civil and political rights, Article Twenty Five, and the highlights of that um, are, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the to vote uh, and to be elected, um, which is basically participation in terms of being the participant, but also in terms of being able you know, to, uh, to stand uh, for election, uh, that the elections have to be periodic, um, uh, they have to be genuine. Uh, the question of genuineness is, is, is an important part of that conversation um, and that there has to be universal and, and equal adult suffrage. It should be held in secret ballot uh, where free expression is guaranteed. So from this article, we see a number of aspects um, that I think constitute uh, the vision uh, for uh, uh, the necessary conditions for free and fair election, uh, periodic elections, universal suffrage, equal suffrage, uh, the right to stand for public office, the right to vote, secret ballot, genuine elections, and, uh, and free expression. And this is also in our, in our constitution, if we look at section 155, um, which states that elections, which must be held regularly and referendums to which this constitution applies, must be peaceful, free, and fair, conducted by secret ballot based on universal adult suffrage and equality of votes and free from violence and other electoral malpractices. Now, when you look at this vision, which the constitution sets for what are conditions for free and fair election, and you now go to look at the context uh, which I have painted, I'm sure you might find yourself uh, with a number of questions. So I've decided to break down that vision um, into five elements um, uh, with, with the help uh, of other uh, um, practitioners and authors who have looked uh, into this. So basically uh, for me, we have got the underlying framework, um, the actual elections themselves, the right to franchise, the right to participate and electoral dispute resolution as the, as the five um, elements that would constitute what I think uh, would be the necessary conditions uh, for free um, and fair elections. Uh, under the underlying uh, framework, uh, of course, uh, we are looking and I've mentioned within the context, the issue of the security environment, um, the electoral authority, uh, which is the election management board, um, the question of uh, civic education, voter information. And the test for what these conditions are like is the type and the degree of violence. And I think we're going to have a conversation to say, do we satisfy this kind of framework? Um, is there free uh, political activity? Um, and is there any violence, any intimidation? Um, are people free to express themselves? And we have seen how COVID-19 has been used as a tool to, uh, uh, to prevent uh, political activity. And of course, we, we can look from afar how the actual uh, elections are going to pan out. The actual vote and counting, uh, timely release of results, electoral grievance and adjudication, election observation. And with the benefit of, um, of precedence, uh, I think the question that we have to look at is how did it go the last time? And has anything changed from the infrastructure that managed the elections last time? Um, and if nothing has changed in that infrastructure that managed the elections, why do we believe that is going to be different? And the test for that, of course, is independence and competence of the election management board. And then, of course, the right to franchise is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a particular pillar uh, for that vision, which is political rights to participation. Uh, the ordinary people have the right to participate um, and, and uh, how is uh, processes related to voter registration, the voters role, participation of minority groups and marginalized groups. Here we speak even of um, uh, members of the diaspora communities. And then, of course, we have as the fourth pillar, um, the participation of political parties and candidates, how they're able to run their campaigns, finance their, their campaigns, 
access to electoral resources, media equality and impartiality, um, as well as the role of big money I've already spoken about, uh, the cartel power dynamics. And of course, the test for that is the state of multi-party activity. And we already have an idea of how multi-party activity um, is, is, is going in this country. And of course, electoral dispute resolution, which is an important part uh, of any election. And we have to look at um, judicial maneuvering and judicialization um, of the current processes. So what does 2023 look like? Um, well, 2023, I think when you look at those five pillars that I have mentioned, um, it finds our military government effectively in control of all levers of power. Political and human rights activists are in prison or facing threat of prison. The patriotic bill is on the horizon and the National Youth Service is about to be unleashed. And that helps answer the question as to the type and degree of violence. On free and fair elections, I think 2023 looks like we still have um, the same election management body with nothing uh, has changed. Um, it's it's uh, independence has to be tested, but it has been tested. So we have some precedents. Uh, recently, I think Zek uh, was quoted saying they are ready for elections and yet by elections are still banned. So who actually then controls the elections? And of course, we have the coming upcoming delimitation exercise on the horizon, which is an indication of how uh, many other people are going to be disenfranchised. Um, and of course, the right to participate with the creation of the government owned political parties, suspension of by-elections, the grabbing of properties from the opposition and the capture of airwaves. We have seen how the government is, uh, you know, licensed itself uh, to run a number of radio stations that are either owned by the government, government-related entities or entities related to politicians. And that tells us uh, how the media is going to, uh, to, be, to, to play part in the next election. And of course, the election dispute resolution mechanisms are currently being captured with the Malawa debacle. The High Court is today just ruled that he can return to work. Um, and we have the capture of the Judicial Service Commission, which as we have seen in the past few days is actually acting as if it's now taking instructions from the executive and we have the amendment bill number two. And these are the mechanisms that we expect to, res to resolve uh, our election uh, processes. Now, how then do we resolve this? In the recent publication that Dr. Mandaza has mentioned, I make reference to the fact that elections are supposed to be empowering. And there must be a tool which enables hopeful and authentic participation. And I emphasize authentic. But in, when we look at the context that we have just mentioned and the experience that we have had in Zimbabwe, um, elections are a nightmare, particularly because they are associated with violence and fraud. They're breeding ground for conflict, which will take decades to resolve. The human and economic cost is devastating. And finding a solution to that requires deep structural changes. And at the center of these are what I call the core principles, values, and virtues. Now, how do we unlock that center? Uh, I have a few suggestions um, that I would uh, want to share uh, in, the, in the next few minutes. Um, and I think the first one is uh, participation. I will speak about the myths and the truths related to participation. Now, the dilemma that we face with participation is, do we just participate in elections regardless of the outcome? Now, many times when we do civic education around participation, it appears that's the message. So many times we are emphasizing on the need um, to participate, um, to go and register to vote. Um, but we know that there are a number of factors that affect participation. And one of them being confidence in the participation process, in the process. Uh, how are we addressing um, this participation? Uh, we've got a case uh, of Malawi, the case of Malawi, um, wherein we have seen in the last election a convergence of various sectors of the society 
in terms of participation? How do we give meaning to real participation? Not just by ordinary citizens, but by other institutions. Uh, in, 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 in Zimbabwe, participation takes a different form. So I've read a lot of literature and I want to avoid going into that literature on how to detect fraud and all those other things. Um, that is really good in terms of principles, in terms of practices, um, in terms of education. But we should not forget the context that I have just painted for Zimbabwe, where we have got a military government in power, where we have got a captured judiciary, where we have got um, uh, decimated opposition and all that context. And we, we are looking at elections in 2023 as they have been in 2018 and other elections that are more than just a fraud. Elections are going to be a daylight robbery as they have always been because the perpetrators of that robbery in Zimbabwe do not hide it. So there's no need to worry about detecting it. They do not hide it. They do it in broad daylight and they don't care. A good example is the case of, uh, 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 of Nduna who clearly uh, lost the election, but the court refuses to make an, um, an arithmetic correction to an election that has been lost because they want to maintain an artificial two thirds so that they can, um, uh, they can, they can, uh, they can uh, pass amendments that they need. So how then do we deal with that? Because this is the demon that surrounds participation, which is why our participation is very low. The role of civil society needs to be interrogated. I do come from a civil society background. And I know when it comes to elections, I have sat in many meetings where we actually think our role is only to monitor. We actually forget that we are actually also citizens of this country. And the Malawi case for me is very inspiring when you look at how um, the coalition of human rights organizations decided to come forward and step forward and lead uh, a civic action against a stolen election. But here in Zimbabwe, civil society, we want to document. So we're on the sidelines. We want to see that when people uh, go to the, to the forefront of, of, of civic action, uh, how many are going to be beaten because that's what we're going to report tomorrow and all those things. I challenge that role of civil society to say that civil society needs to be at the forefront of the push to opening the democratic space. And this does not have to wait for an election day and it has to happen early. The power of money, this is an, an interrogated subject when it comes to elections. And I think cartel power dynamics has shown us the power of big money in elections. And we need to have a conversation around how elections, our elections are now for sale. Effect, if, if, if only one party has got monopoly over resources and they're using state resources to drive an agenda and they're taking resources from other participants, it's very clear where the election is going. And we don't need to wait until the election to be able to contest um, the power of money. And we need to be able to expose the actors that are pushing such an agenda. The issue of electoral integrity really um, needs no emphasis. It's clear and I think it's on the open. And then the post election security plan. As we have mentioned that we are within a security establishment and there's need to have a conversation around how do we not only promote electoral integrity but how do we secure its outcome? There has never been a clear strategy on how that can be done. And I think it's very important to look at how that should be done. Um, as I conclude um, on what stands in the way, there are five myths that I want to comment on surrounding elections in Zimbabwe. And I think uh, responding to these myths and finding strategies around these myths it helps us in terms of finding uh, a way to create the necessary conditions for a free and fair election. Now, the disclaimer is, I think the 2023 election has already been lost. Um, others see differently, but I don't think we should do nothing. I think even if it means we don't see results immediately, there are things that we should begin to do in order to build um, a culture of free and fair elections. Uh, and it's not a subject that should make us simply look at 2023. I think we need to have a long-term vision, not to say because these conditions are not in place 
and 2023 is already closed, then there's nothing we can do, then we do nothing. I think if we do that, we, we make a serious mistake. Myth number one that we have to bust, that the next election will always be better than the previous one. The worst victims of this myth are opposition political uh, actors, opposition political parties. This is wherein the election is clearly a fraud. The election itself, the process before it happened is clearly a fraud. And it's a trap. Uh, and people are clearly being trapped into an election like what happened in 2013 and what happened in 2018. But something happens, there's a demon, there's a spirit that captures Zimbabwe each time we get close to an election. And there's a euphoria, which even when all scientific signals are telling you that this election is a trap, it's a fraud, it's a myth, it's not a real election. For some reason, when we see those people at rallies and start seeing those and start seeing all those t-shirts for some reason we just convince ourselves especially opposition politicians we just convince ourselves that the next one will be different for you know that it was stolen in the same way that it was stolen the infrastructure is not changed but we still want to move and nothing has changed so that's a myth that we need to deal with we need to tell each other the truth that the next election actually this one is going to be worse than the previous one because the opposition is in a worse state than it was in 2018. And there has been consolidation of power through a number uh, of mechanisms that we have seen. So that's myth number one. Myth number two is that if they see our numbers, they will give us a seat on the table. So participation in election ceases to be about bringing to birth the will of the people. But for some reason, even as we know that all the signals are leading in the wrong direction, for some reason that we think if they see that we've got two million votes, then we'll get a seat on the negotiating table. That linked to myth number three, that the incumbent cares about legitimacy. So no matter how much we have been exposing and all this and all this, and how much we have been playing the legitimacy card, card, it has never worked because the incumbent cares about capturing the state, its resources and survival. So we need to deal with that myth. And then, the fourth myth is that delivering a credible, a credible election is the duty of the sitting government. So a credible election has got all those elements that we spoke about, including participation. And I look at the reluctance um, that is on the political arena, th th this belief that delivering a credible election is the duty of the sitting government, but participation is part of delivering a credible election. And other actors, including opposition, civil society, they have got a role to lift participation. As long as our participation is below 60%, it means we should not sleep. And we have got a role as, and at the same time, we also are to blame in a way uh, when we fail uh, to get a credible election. Myth number five, that internal democracy is less important than popular vote. This is wherein political parties think that what they do in house is none of the electorate's business. But when they go to election, they want the electorate to choose them. And I think this is the mistake that we have been making over the years. And I think this due to rests on all political actors to realize that elections are part of, building credible elections is part of deepening a culture of democracy and human rights. And part of that process includes building internal mechanisms for democracy, including accountability for violation of human rights, including succession planning, including all those best practices that we demand from government. Because when we don't do that, we risk pushing for transitions without transformation in the way that we do business. These five myths, I think, lead, lead me to conclusion that many times, many times when we are looking at creating conditions um, for, 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 for credible elections, we think it's an issue of us simply demanding from the government in power. I think it is a shared responsibility and we need to play um, our part, whether we are civil society, whether we're, we're citizens or we are political parties. And we need to ask the difficult questions now and not wait until an election has been robbed in daylight to then think we can raise the dust. The dust. 
I think it's very important that even at this point in time, as we are having this conversation, it becomes very clear that all the scientific evidence leads to one direction. Then we should avoid getting into the election euphoria that makes us think that for some reason, the next election will be different from the previous election. Um, and in conclusion, I want to end with this quotation from, uh, uh, from Anan, which says, when the electorate believes that elections have been free and fair, they can be a powerful catalyst for better governance, greater security and human development. But in the absence of credible elections, citizens have no recourse to peaceful political change. The risk of conflict increases while corruption, intimidation, and fraud go unchecked, rotting the entire political system slowly from within. Now, this statement is a warning. Um, in many advanced democracies, elections are a matter of choice. Unfortunately, in our country, because we have experienced gross human rights violations, elections are now a moral duty for citizens, for individuals, for political parties to try and deepen the five principles that I have just mentioned. Because we have an experience in which we know that the next elections, just as the previous ones, are a nightmare in which citizens know that the next elections are not going to deliver prosperity, they are going to deliver dead bodies. The elections in which we know that the companies that deal um, uh, with death are going to increase their budget because they are coming into business. Uh, with those uh, few words, Chair, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... <clears throat> And Zingamai, you, you have touched on so many important uh, issues, but I can't help to say that having being a person who has been following the Zimbabwean elections for, for many years, I'm just so despondent uh, because it appears that, um, you know, the end is not in sight regarding all the difficult issues that uh, we have seen happening in Zimbabwe around the electoral process. My takeaway from your presentation is really the role of civil society and how civil society perceives its role. There is no government that's going to change on its own. Civil society is the vanguard of democracy everywhere in the world. So what you said about the role of civil society and that, that paradigm shift that you're talking about, civil society in Zimbabwe, moving away from seeing itself as merely documenting human rights violations that happened around an election and so, and being active participants, it's very, very important for me. What saddens me is that in most countries, the, the last line of defense when everything else fails is the judiciary. And we have seen that in Malawi, and we saw that happening in Kenya with the elections they being set aside. So if, if uh, we have no hope in the judiciary and if the judiciary is captured, it means that we have to think deep and strategize about what is it that has to be done to change the situation regarding the and which is my last point two points i think regarding the opposition really the issue is it's what we're dealing there with is politics of the stomach um because the the shenanigans that happens and the deals that are cut between the ruling party and the so-called um, opposition actually happens in practice. You haven't mentioned the role of election observers, which is something that bothers me immensely on the African continent, particularly the role of our institutions, multilateral institutions, the role of SADC, 
the role of the AU. And I don't know until when are we going to, to have a situation where they come into a country and turn their blind, turn a blind eye completely to the suffering of the citizens and simply declaring an election free and fair. And it becomes business as usual. That pains me that we ourselves as Africans, we can't look each other in the eyes and tell each other the truth about where we are messing up. So with those few words, I will then invite our next panelist. Uh, I I'm now have to, to go back to my thingy. Uh, my sister, Laura Miti. Uh, you have 10 minutes and I hope you will deal with some of the issues and tell us about uh, Zambia and what is it that we can learn, if at all, from the Zambian situation. Laura, take it away, my sister. You have 10 minutes. Sure. Um... Uh, so, hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zikamai. That was a very uh, informative and instructive uh, presentation. And uh, what I will try to do is speak about what we can learn from Zimbabwe. And I suppose maybe a little bit of um, what Zimbabwe maybe can learn from us. Um, well, my heart is entirely Zambian. I am half Zimbabwean, <laughs> um, so I've always had an interest in what happens now because my mother, my mother, and all her people are from uh, Zimbabwe, so, and and that link between us, I think, uh, as countries, is uh, very important. I think, especially right now, where we have a situation in which it seems that our current government envies the power that Zimbabwean leaders. Have. So we seem to, we, in Zambia, we have decided that um, Zimbabwe, whether it's uh, President Mugabe and then Minangogo now, and President Museveni are President Lungu's heroes. So what they've been able to do in those countries is what is being tried to be done here. And so we are having elections uh, this year. And to a large extent, what was being uh, explained by Zikamai is what has been attempted here. Some of what he has said has succeeded and some has failed. So I think I'll start with what failed because the only reason we can still talk about the elections right now is that they attempt to capture the constitution in what I think most people have heard and not in what we were calling Bill 10 back here uh, failed. And if that uh, constitution amendment had passed, right now we'd be having very academic elections because by that uh, constitutional amendment, one, uh, I think most importantly, is so something that would have very easily passed under the radar if CSOs had not um, identified it, is that the constitution of parliament, so the numbers of parliament had been removed from the constitution and were supposed to be placed in a subsidiary law, which meant that at any given time, the constitution, could, um, the numbers of parliament could change. So all the, all, all the sitting government needed to do was win elections and then keep changing the numbers and giving itself a two-thirds majority, which would then mean that um, they could change the constitution anytime they wanted. And then there was the issue of uh, the uh, collision government where the sitting government or, or the, the winner of, of, of the first round of elections could negotiate with any party that had stood the elections to, to go over the 51%, uh, 50 plus 1% uh, margin. And what was going to happen there is instead of rigging for itself, government, the sitting uh, party could have rigged for a very, for a smaller party and then crossed uh, the margin. There was, of course, the issue of um, deputy ministers. So uh, our last constitutional amendment removed deputy ministers. Those were supposed to come back and then the limit on the number of cabinet ministers was going to be removed. And then also parliament 
after parliament was dissolved, the cabinet, cabinet was going to stay in place. Now, there were quite a few other changes, but just with those, would have been would have found ourselves right now with an election in which, first of all, before uh, uh, the election happened, there could have been delimitation. So uh, the president would have, the, would have had the power to create constituencies and districts without, without, without limit, and then would be campaigning right now with uh, unlimited resources from the state because ministers would be in power as well as in office, as well as deputy ministers. Now, that brings me to the issue of uh, maybe civil society, because it was civil society that fought a, a, a really protected uh, battle against this amendment. And it looked for a long time that uh, we would lose the battle because government threw so much money at, at the issue. And, and it was very cleverly put uh, in such a way that at, at some point, uh, some citizens did not understand why anyone was standing against it. But because civil society garnered uh, the public voice in a rejection where they just could not go with it, opposition members were able to stand up and vote against it. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's only because of that that we still have uh, elections that we might have a hope uh, could be maybe possibly credible, not very sure. Uh, but at least there will be some kind of elections. So the, the role of civil society is extremely important, especially when opposition has been weakened. So I agree um, when um, Zikamai says that civil society should not sit back and say it, should, it will document um, uh, whatever illegal acts happen during an election. There are times when civil society must step up and take the gap left behind by uh, opposition that has been captured. So in the case of Zimbabwe, what is extremely uh, concerning and makes me very sad is that with the opposition captured like that, you feel as though it's, you need two cycles before anything can be done to limit uh, the control of ZANU-PF on the country. Because you do need, if you're going to have a democracy, you need an opposition that has the capacity to stand against the, the ruling party. And um, now with MDC essentially um, an academic opposition party, you, you, you get the sense that you need a long time to, to rebuild. I think in the case of Zambia, we've been most fortunate in that the, the, the main opposition survived. I don't even know how, but they, they survived. And right now, there they seems to be a, I think like, like happened in Zimbabwe, that swing where people, you feel that the, 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 the opposition is, at least if you, if you just look at what's happening in the country, more popular than the ruling party. But I think like Zimbabwe, we feel that the, 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 the rigging is going to be systematic. The rigging is going to be structural. For us, the rigging is first of all on the voters' role. So in the, in the voters' role, somehow the electoral commission managed to reduce the numbers uh, in all the opposition party strongholds. So the, 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 the numbers of voters on the voters' role have reduced and increased uh, in the uh, increased in the ruling party's uh, strongholds. Uh, that, that's, that's very concerning. Um, so the, there's, there's the issue of the, of the voters' role. There is just uh, the issue that we all know that 2016 and 2015 were, 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 were both rigged. I think the only difference for us is, that, is the sense that in 2015 and, 2015 and 2016, the, the opposition parties and the ruling party, the, the difference was, was really marginal. So the, the, the sitting president or President Lungu was quite popular. He had a constituency. Right now, it's very difficult to identify who supports President Lungu, even within his own constituencies. So you, you, uh, people t talk about members of parliament, the ruling party winning maybe, but not him. So uh, for that reason, uh, Zambia might have a little bit of hope, but our, our, our president does not seem to have the ability to enter a, a, a free and fair election. So we all know that uh, some, kind, some major rigging is going, to, is going to happen. The only thing that might stop it is, 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 is people power. So maybe uh, like happened in Malawi, just the sense that Zambians will not accept it. But again, I'm, uh, I'm not very sure. 
when we come to the issue of the judiciary, we are like uh, Zimbabwe very in a very worrying position because our constitutional court seems to, I don't know whether I can call it captured, but maybe to have been created with the sole purpose of uh, ensuring that it is the last line of defense is, instead of, of, of citizens, but for, is, is, is for the ruling party. So our constitutional court judges, it's, it's been shown that none of them really qualify constitutionally to be sitting there. So, uh, excuse me, the qualifications needed are not there. And they've passed ruling after ruling that's concerning. Tomorrow, the eligibility of the president is coming up for ruling. We don't hold out um, much hope for that. And if that happens, uh, no, if the, cons the, the, the constitutional court remains as... Um, partial as it is, there's the possibility of two things. One, any post-election resolution is academic uh, because it, the, the ruling will be, will be against the opposition like happened in 2016. But also a win by the opposition could be overturned by the constitutional court. So the, the constitutional court has been packed by uh, judges with, with judges that are very pro-government very pro-government and, and simply unapologetic about it. So the only way uh, anything changes in Zambia is if the win is clear at the, at the elections in August. Um, I will end by saying that these elections for Zambia are critical. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are sitting quite under the rug, actually. I mean, um, so much has happened in Zambia that I think most people in the region do not realize, largely because we still suffer from our reputation of being a peaceful country and all that, a democratic country, and everybody still thinks that is who we are. But where we're sitting right now is if the sitting government of the, 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 the patriotic fund wins the elections, we cross, we cross into both Congo and Zimbabwe. Um, in, in, in that, the, the level Unity that has had is whether it's official. Zikamai was talking the buying of uh, the the buying of violence or the sponsoring of of, of, of violence and uh, uh, institution is such that if they win the election, then there's nothing to stop them uh, uh, after the election. And of course, our our economy is in such a mess that we do not know what then happens after. Um, the election. So it is absolutely crucial. And in Zambia, both civil society and citizens, it's a question of trying to keep your fingers crossed, but also trying to protect the vote. So I think I, what, I would say, what I would say is that, yes, uh, things are very bad in Zambia, but largely because of that win in the constitution and that maybe Zambians are still a little more um, militant, uh, and also expecting of democracy is, is what we are uh, hoping will, will take us through um, this uh, August. But the, the, it's, it's, things are not looking entirely good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Laura. And, and once again, your presentation underscored that of uh, Zigamai because it's, it really reiterated the importance of the role of civil society organizations and uh, the changes that we are able to bring through the activism of the uh, Zambian civil society. But just from my experience also talking to civil society organizations to say, as I said when I started, that rigging starts quite early in an electoral process. If at all, as, and, and, and I also encourage civil society that works in elections uh, also to ensure that they sharpen their technical skills on election management. Because if, 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 if at all, there is no transparency in the way in which um, the, the boundaries, constituency boundaries are demarca demarcated, if um, the, the formula for doing that is not made known, then you end up with gerrymandering of, of constituencies. And once that has been done, you can, you can fight as much as you want to. Uh, you will never win an election because of the way that uh, boundaries have been demarcated and some of the issues that Laura has indicated about 
the voters' role and uh, where is it? Uh, you, you know that most of the voters uh, that are in the ruling party uh, strongholds are the ones that find themselves in the voters' role. And that begs the question of the transparency of uh, voter registration, because that also plays a very uh, a big part. And the, the, the whole issue that I'm raising is the issue of access to information, the role of access to information in the entire electoral process. And when I was still with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, as a special rapporteur, there's a document that uh, we, we adopted being um, access to information in the electoral process. And I would recommend um, that those who are interested should look at it uh, uh, on the website of the African Commission, because it says at the, at the end of all, there has to be transparency throughout the electoral process. There has to be proactive disclosure of information. You have to know who, who's playing what role in, in the electoral process. Um, so I think you, you, you so, so, so for, our, for elections to change in many of our countries, we really need a structural change because everything else will be cosmetic. And with, with those a uh, few words, I think I have to I have to check. I'm sorry, because the names of my uh, the presenters are here. And, and I think the next uh, panelist that we welcome is a gift trappings from Malawi. You have 10 minutes gift. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think I was listening to um, the previous presenters. I think it's very touching um, in terms of the issues that you are discussing, specifically uh, democracy uh, in Africa. One issue that I wanted just to pick uh, is on the shrinking space. I think it's an issue that um, in Malawi we were also struggling with. When you have a government that that don't care in terms of the fundamental pillars of democracy being respected, you find a challenge. I think this is a challenge also we had uh, in Malawi as civil society organizations. Uh, because during that time, you find that everyone uh, was afraid. Our, our struggle as civil society, I think in terms of um, using people power, uh, started in 2011, uh, where we had demonstrations and uh, about 20, 21 people were killed for a short day uh, by, the, by the police meaning that uh, the government that time was using excessive power um, to make sure that it sustain uh, its mandate to govern um, in Malawi. So since that time, uh, Malawians were so afraid, you couldn't even talk about uh, demonstrations. And one issue that also we noted as civil society organizations, I think there is disconnect between what we do and the people on the ground. I think where politicians have, you know, beaten the civil society organizations is because they think that uh, they have followers who are political party followers. They think that um, they own people. Uh, and that is why maybe it's an area that uh, we need to work uh, as civil society to make sure that we create what we call the people power. But you cannot create uh, the people power when the middle class, when the rural uh, citizens, when even poor people are not, associate, are not associate, associated with our work. I think we need to look at 
the specific issues that can resonate uh, citizens uh, to be part and parcel of, of the movement. Um, I think the politicians have taken advantage uh, of uh, the proper levels of our citizens uh, to make sure that they're able to twist uh, the democratic uh, principles. So for us as a civil sort organization in Malawi, I think what we noted is to look at um, the critical issues, the needs of the citizens uh, that they can associate uh, with, the issues that uh, uh, they, are, they are able uh, to, to feel that pain. I think uh, that is why maybe you see, you saw a lot of Malawians coming in millions. And for us, what we noted is that um, we had the political power. Because when you talk about citizens, it's not only an ordinary citizens, whether you talk about the judiciary, whether you talk about the army, whether you talk about the police, uh, the organs that governments use to suppress uh, citizens, uh, you find that uh, in those spaces, we have also, uh, these are also citizens. Uh, if we, uh, there is a crisis in terms of electricity, a crisis uh, in terms of uh, fuel or price hike, these citizens are also affected. So the most important for me is um, to look at the issues that the citizens uh, can associate with. Uh, by doing that, that would be uh, you know, a mobilization on its own. So I wanted uh, to just to raise that because that's where I think uh, civil society organizations maybe we have not uh, done well in terms of uh, making sure that we have that uh, political capital uh, uh, for the people to mobilize. Otherwise, if we are only a few, uh, I think things cannot change. Uh, we can only change things when we have the number. Uh, if you have uh, many citizens, millions of citizens on your side, there's no way the government can kill uh, the, whole, the whole nation. Uh, so I think for me, what is more important is to look at those elements that uh, makes um, these, uh, the states, uh, you know, to have that impunity. You have already said the, the power of money, which is corruption. So corruption is a cartel. Uh, it is in different spaces. Uh, so we need to look at the critical uh, issues that can open the democratic uh, space. Uh, and we should also look at, um, you know, uh, this, the process of empowering uh, the citizens as not an event. Uh, we should go beyond uh, the elections. We need maybe to start uh, empowering our, 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 our citizens, uh, not as a project, but uh, as, a, as a process, as I'm saying. But we cannot do that without also other key players. And the media uh, is, is key. The moment we miss the messaging uh, that, can, that can allow, that can move citizens uh, to be associated with that uh, agenda, uh, then we'll have also a problem of trust. So the most important uh, issue for us is to create that trust. That, the, the trust that, uh, uh, people can feel that they can be they cannot be sought. Uh, I think that's what also we noted uh, when we were doing the demonstrations. We did the demonstration for almost one year, and we were not tired. Uh, and the numbers were growing uh, uh, by the end of the day. Uh, so what we noted is is also that uh, we created. Uh, that trust from, from the citizens, including citizens from the rural areas. So for me, if we get the trust, if we create the active citizenship, uh, if we have the right uh, messaging in terms of the agenda, it will be very easy you know, to mobilize. And that will be our political capital, even in terms of reforms, even in terms of uh, the laws that we would want uh, to change, to make sure that we have electoral justice. But electoral justice will not be there 
if we are coming from a weak uh, point in terms of uh, the issue of bargaining, uh, unless we have that power, uh, we can be looked at as equals when we are on the table. Uh, these are some of the things that I wanted just to, uh, to share. Uh, but I think the last issue that I wanted to so just to, to, to say is that if you, when we have an empowered you know, uh, citizens, even the issue of monitoring, citizens will monitor the elections on their own. We don't need um, an observer from somewhere, even at your own at level as locals, people can be able uh, to monitor the elections. Uh, this is the case that happened in Malawi uh, during the fresh elections. The citizens were following uh, all the processes on their own. Uh, so for me, I think the fundamental uh, issue that I'm trying to raise here is the issue of the civil society uh, to be strong, uh, to be passionate about their work, uh, to make sure that they are able to create uh, the people power. But that will also depend on the trust that you can have as leaders. And uh, we should also demonstrate that we are fearless. Because the moment uh, we, are, we, 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 are, we are afraid, even those people that are trusting us, they will also be afraid. Uh, so moving forward, uh, maybe... We expect uh, to have strong uh, you know, leaders who can lead uh, the movement of making sure that we have activist citizen, citizenry uh, across Africa. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gift. And, and, and once again, also in, in, in your input, the issue of the importance of civil society uh, came up. And really, the issue of the shrinking space uh, for civil society organization is an important because issue because even if a civil society wants to, to, be, to operate and play their role, if the environment within which it's supposed to operate is not conducive, then the civil society cannot be effective. For instance, you talked about you know, citizens uh, monitoring the elections, that if that happens, yeah, we you would not even uh, be relying on uh, uh, regional or international observers. But you know, I observed, and and the whole issue is the issue of the conducive environment, the laws that are there. Because I led an observer mission to the 2020 Tanzanian elections, and most of the active civil society organizations, including religious groups were denied accreditation by the electoral management body. But having said that, I think uh, we also ourselves as uh, civil society organizations, we have to do a self introspect about who are we representing? Are we representing the, 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 the grassroots? Are we in touch with the real people? When we speak, are we speaking on, on, on their behalf? Have we uh, contacted them? Are we in touch with them? Because what our, what our governments are doing, they capitalize on the hunger and poverty of the citizens. As civil society organizations, we might try to mobilize civil society, uh, uh, grassroots. Uh, 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 we might organize, try to, to mobilize the ordinary people. But how government bids us, they capitalize on the hunger and the poverty of the people by doing what? By giving them food parcels in exchange for votes. And if people have no food, um, those kind of things become important. And lastly, I think Gift mentioned the issue of the media. I think it's one of the issues that we have to look at because the COVID has affected the traditional media. Media houses are closing. It is difficult out there. And in this environment, we then rely on social media to reach out. But our governments as well, I mean, they, they, they control the social media. I mean, I was following the Nigerian situation with President Buhari. Uh, just because Twitter closed his account, then he then stops Twitter in the country. 
uh, he suspends it and much to the suffering of many people, young people in particular, whose businesses uh, rely on the use of Twitter and other social media uh, platforms. With, with those remarks and as, as time is moving, let's hear from our discussants. Uh, we have a, a Zesson, which um, I've worked with uh, many years ago. Ellen, in the light of, of all that has been said, uh, what are you saying to us? How do you respond, Ellen? Thank you. And how, Thank you very much. I mean, this, the, the picture is so bleak. I, I get so, it's very discouraging. I mean, we have so many problems, uh, all of us on the continent, uh, where we are, just the space in which we are. And hearing what I'm hearing, it, it gets so depressing, but we have to keep on keeping and be positive and make sure that we keep on fighting. And I just want to hear from you that after hearing what you have heard, what, what words of wisdom do you have for us? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. And um, thanks to our panelists for the insightful presentations. And um, it, it indeed, uh, the presentation gives a gloomy picture of uh, how our, our, our region is with regards to management, um, administration of elections, even the environment, the political environment, the legal framework, and so forth. So it's, it's really worrying, but I think um, over the years, we need to appreciate also that we have seen uh, some strides. We have seen uh, a number of uh, reforms being uh, put in place by um, our governments in, in the region. I think in particular, we can, we, we, as Zimbabwe, we borrowed a lot from countries like Malawi and South Africa, as well as Zambia. And I'm glad that part of our panelists are from these countries I will give examples um, of things that we've actually adopted from these countries, these three countries that are, are part of this discussion. In Zambia, it's uh, one country where we learned about polling station-based voting, its advantages, and of course, its disadvantages. And uh, we realized that we there were more advantages than the disadvantages. Of course, the disadvantages around political retribution post-election, but the advantages with regards to the, the actual maintenance and instilling confidence of the voters' role. In Malawi, I remember we, we learned about the use of translucent ballot boxes. For your own information, we actually made that recommendation after observing elections in Malawi. And it's one of the forms that was adopted by our government. And in, in South Africa, the electoral system, of course, um, the PR which brings in women, and uh, but of course we don't have the PR uh, in, in, in my country, uh, in both houses, but we have borrowed the system and we have used a hybrid system where we have the PR in the upper house. And uh, that's also one area that we have also learned and adopted in, in, in South Africa. So indeed, uh, elections in Zimbabwe definitely, um, they are going to really, uh, if uh, we were six, will be very high. And uh, we need to continue observing and also um, not documenting like what my colleagues did, uh, but also making sure that uh, as civic society, we come up with innovative ways of ensuring that we really influence the electoral reform discourse and process in our, in our countries, in particular, the countries that are holding elections in the near future. I think for Zambia, it's not very late though, but there are things that you need to watch out for. Uh, as you go for the elections uh, in August. I think making sure that as domestic observers, you have um, a civic society, you have observers on the ground to monitor the pre-election environment, which has got a very huge bearing on the uh, outcome of the election. In my country, you realize that uh, in the pre-election environment, where things like uh, uh, intimidation, harassment of voters, vote buying, abuse of state resources, this is where everything happens few months before election or, or, or a, a year or so before an election. So you really need to make sure that you are comprehensively um, monitoring or observing this process and documenting uh, the process so that whenever uh, you put out your maybe initial statements or reports, you have an analysis of the whole electoral phase period, not only to monitor the polling day. So maybe moving from the documenting only and also ensuring that 
you actually are reactionary where there are, are issues of intimidation or violations that you're actually noting now, you quickly uh, intervene and also issue statements as civic society and try and influence um, uh, the process to be free and fair. Um, unfortunately for our country, by-elections have been suspended, but it would have been good if we're holding by-elections to also assess um, what kind of reforms our, our, our country is putting in place. In 2018, after observing the elections, my organization, we actually compiled all the recommendations from the observer missions that came to Zimbabwe. And we noted that there were 223 recommendations that were made by observer missions, the SADAC, uh, that mod the moderator was talking about, AU, we had the European Union with Commonwealth and, and other observer missions, and even local observers. So those recommendations, we need to know what has been implemented to date and what has not. With regards to the legal framework, there hasn't, there hasn't been any movement except uh, the extension of the quota system for women and the introduction of the youth quota for, 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 for the youth. So um, we want to continue to monitor our electoral reforms and how recommendations that were proffered by the election observer missions are implemented. But unfortunately, by elections have been suspended and uh, an opportunity has been lost to observe developments and assessment of possible freeness or fairness of the 2023 election. And then uh, moving forward, one of the recommendations that we also have, I think colleagues have spoken about it, the issue of ensuring that our election management bodies are truly independent. Uh, they also have to be trusted by the citizens. They have to be trusted by the political parties, political parties mainly being the key and primary stakeholder in election processes. If there are no political parties, there are no elections. So they have to be trusted by opposition political parties. And I think we are grappling with this challenge in my country at the moment, where of course, we, when you see our commission uh, posting a Twitter, the reactions that we see on Twitter, also acknowledging that uh, Twitter is not the whole of Zimbabwe. We know that, but the reactions that you see on uh, the Twitter end of the election mon management is evidence that there's totally lack of trust and confidence in the e EMB. And if anything go by, this will have also implications for perceptions about freeness and fairness in 2023 elections. Whether in actual fact these elections would have been free, perceptions of stakeholders will always matter when it comes to providing the uh, verdict or assessing elections. So in other words, an election does not only need to be free and fair, but it has to be perceived as such. Perceptions are very important when it comes to elections. So therefore, for, for my election management body, we have been encouraging them to address the issues around uh, perception uh, before 2023, and also to allay the fears that the electorate has when it comes to um, the confidence. So maybe- Helen, I'm sorry. Up. I think you have to you have to work with me. You had five minutes, um, and I have two other discussants, and we have to open. Okay. It. Can you just uh, uh, wind up? Okay. So so thank you very much. So the issue of perceptions, like I said, and there's need to ensure that trust is built, and um, there's uh, confidence. And uh, issues of election boundary delimitation are very critical as well. In Zimbabwe, we are supposed to have our boundary delimitation maybe sometime next year, but uh, already we are worried about the, the quality, about the methodology and so forth. So I totally agree with uh, what my colleagues have actually said with regards to issues of fairness and uh, issues of, uh, uh, of uh, freeness of elections. The political environment, I think my colleague Zikama spoke at length about that. But uh, at the end of the day, maybe what I can ask is, we need also to continue interacting with uh, key stakeholders, academics, so that we continue to have innovative ideas on how we can improve our electoral processes as a region, in particular, um, Zimbabwe, Zambia, countries that have challenges and that are going for elections in the near future. Probably I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Nyingi Anyangolo, please come in. Uh, work with me five minutes and immediately thereafter, Newo, please follow. So I, I, I will not call you and then we can take uh, 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 questions from the floor. Thank you. Just in that order. Five minutes, please. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think most of the issues have been raised uh, in, uh, by the panelists. 
And therefore, in the five minutes that I've been given, I will uh, focus on uh, maybe just two points. Uh, one is the issue of the point that was raised with regard to judicial capture uh, versus uh, judicial independence. Uh, borrowing from the experience uh, of Malawi, it was uh, quite uh, obvious that uh, uh, post-2019, the judiciary uh, played a very important role uh, in the, looking at the outcome uh, of the election. But that role, when you look at it, if we are indeed to balance uh, and uh, ensure that there's no judicial capture, uh, was um, set way before uh, the uh, actual case, uh, in this case, the electoral case in Malawi uh, went to court. And therefore, we had uh, situations where there were attempts uh, to capture the judiciary. And uh, an example was uh, when uh, the executive uh, forced uh, the chief justice uh, to go on leave. And uh, uh, following from that uh, incident, it was quite obvious that uh, the other players uh, played an important role to make sure that uh, the judiciary was uh, protected. So for example, there was a group of uh, concerned lawyers that uh, actually uh, organized uh, countrywide demonstrations against uh, the forced leave of uh, the chief justice. And uh, in that regard, it was uh, uh, interesting to note that uh, the Malawi Law Society was shy uh, to take up uh, the issue, uh, to uh, go to the streets, and therefore left it uh, to the concerned uh, lawyers. Uh, however, it uh, managed to play an important role in that uh, it challenged the executive in court uh, against uh, the removal or the first leave of the chief justice. And I think for me that buttresses the point uh, that has been made that uh, it is very critical that uh, you have uh, various players playing different roles. Uh, because if you look at uh, the issues, uh, they are very, very complex and uh, there are quite a number of uh, forces. Uh, uh, the way that uh, the first speaker uh, uh, Mr. Berry uh, unpacked, you know, that framework, uh, it shows us the complexity of the problem. And therefore, if it is that complex, it means that the solution must also be very multifaceted, and therefore the different players must play uh, their role. And therefore, for us, uh, how uh, the consent lawyers uh, worked with uh, Malawi Law Society, worked with the other civil society, like the human rights defenders, uh, was quite obvious uh, that uh, it helped uh, to ensure that uh, we had uh, uh, protected the uh, independence of the judiciary. So that by the time that uh, we had the TPEX uh, uh, elections and uh, the parties uh, went to court, uh, there was a, a lot of confidence uh, in the judiciary that uh, the judiciary may be able to deliver uh, justice as, uh, as they did. And uh, therefore, uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, judicial independence. And uh, linked to that, maybe it's the, also the issue of uh, uh, rule of law, uh, the extent to which various players were able to take up matters to court and uh, make sure that uh, each aspect of the elections that was in dispute, if not resolved by the uh, electoral management body, uh, issues were taken to court and uh, the court dealt with the issues uh, expeditiously. And therefore, uh, the uh, way in which uh, the law uh, facilitated a process that allowed uh, for uh, free and fair elections uh, was uh, quite commendable. And I think it's something that uh, we're learning. And uh, then related to uh, that issue is the issue of uh, uh, security that uh, was also talked about. Um, if you follow uh, the kind of uh, demonstrations that we had over almost a year, it was quite obvious that uh, you know uh, the security um, institutions were really, really challenged. It was very possible to have such sustained resistance uh, because uh, on the one hand, we had the police and uh, the police did not seem to work in favor of uh, citizens and uh, rule of law. Uh, but on the other, we had the, the army, and the army came in uh, to protect uh, demonstrators on a number of times uh, to ensure that uh, the demonstrations were very, very peaceful. And to that extent, uh, it became quite obvious that uh, 
uh, security institutions play an important role uh, in creating the space, for example, that uh, uh, Mr. Trappens talked about and he allowed for citizens uh, to express themselves, for citizens uh, to show their displeasure uh, with the outcome of the elections. And the, that role, although very delicate, uh, ensured that uh, there was a balanced uh, power relations between the police and the, the army, and the, that the, the army and the military were able uh, to manage uh, the situation. Lastly, for me, I, I think it's to buttress the point that has been made uh, with regard to vigilance uh, in monitoring of the elections, not just by political parties, but by all citizens. The extent to which the case that went to court, the electoral case, depended a lot on the evidence that had been collected over time and properly documented by the political parties, you know, become very, very important. Uh, it was uh, very encouraging to see in court how the witnesses came forward and uh, were able to give evidence on how they actually monitored the length of time and uh, had actually had evidence. I think it was also the role of able to report the political parties uh, when they were in court. I have in mind, for example, the role that uh, the Women Lawyers Association, Yingi. the Malawi Law Society. Hello. Yes. Yingi. I'll be one. Please work with me. Work with me, please. Time is up. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm winding up and uh, emphasizing the point that uh, the Malawi Law Society Women Lawyers Association uh, uh, brought uh, uh, joined the case that was in court as the amicus, and uh, it was uh, uh, they also contributed uh, to the level of evidence that was available in court and uh, uh, managed to develop the jurisprudence around elections in Malawi. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you very much. Um, I, I asked the, the, the next, um, Neo, where are you? I'm here, I'm here, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm there. I can hear you, I can't see you. Let me see. All right, good. Five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this very important discussion. Um, as I don't have much time, I would like to comment on the three issues. Um, I think moderator, you, you guided us that uh, uh, free and fair uh, elections are important but that uh, rigging sometimes takes place way, way, uh, uh, you know, either before the even elections, the first vote is cast. Uh, in the case of Zambia, I want to, to highlight uh, um, three areas. The first is the uneven playing field. A free and fair election uh, should ensure that the play field is even, that all contestants or all the competitors have equal uh, chance to participate. Hello. Equal... Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. That yes, all... yes, we can hear you. We can oh, hear thank you. you very much. I will hear some other echo. That all, all, all participants are able to participate equally and fairly. Now, in the case of Zambia, uh, there is this notorious act called the Public Order Act. This act has been used to restrict uh, movements and uh, meetings by opposition parties. Immediately after the election in 2016, the ruling party went on a roadshow campaigning, uh, having crowds. But whenever opposition parties tried to have meetings, they were stopped uh, and they told that they are not following the, um, uh, the Public Order Act. A number of opposition leaders were arrested in this period. There are, most of these opposition parties actually not, had held, held very few public meetings uh, coming to this election. Uh, but you hear that uh, today, uh, as we are speaking, 
the government has, uh, uh, through the president, the president at a campaign meeting when he was launching uh, his party manifesto, dec you know, decreed more or less, um, ordered the police to stop public rallies on account of COVID. He was doing so when there, were, there was a large crowd of his own supporters outside the, the hall where he was actually uh, launching the manifesto. Uh, but being a, a candidate in the election, you know, that uh, order to the, to, to the police to stop public meetings and to, uh, to the Ministry of, of Health uh, is it, it tantamount to taking over the job of the Electoral Commission. So again, it raises issues about the independence of the Electoral Commission because a few days later, uh, the Electoral Commission actually has now ordered that there should be no public rallies on account of, um, on account of COVID. Understood, uh, at the beginning of the whole process, uh, the Electoral Commission had said that, had advised that uh, parties could hold meetings, but it should ensure they had, had COVID guidelines. Uh, and that uh, public rallies, if possible, should be avoided. Some parties had said they would hold public rallies, but ensure they keep to the guidelines, meaning that they would masking and distance and all those things. But these have gone. Now, what is actually important to underline here is that the ruling party has already campaigned. They've been campaigning without masks all this time. But this time around, they don't want the opposition to actually campaign. So that's an uneven perfect. What the other area has to do with the media, which has been talked about, uh, you don't see opposition advertisements in public media in Zambia at the moment. And yet we are going to the election. So one wonders uh, how, uh, and we have the constitutional requirement, actually the constitutional provision that the public media is supposed to be accessible during elections, but it's not being done. Of course, the rhetoric is that they are going to do it, but it's not being done. Uh, the other point I thought I would do underline uh, is uh, to do with the, uh, the shrinking democratic space. I think this is a very important point. Um, it's important because in Zambia, we are not allowed to hold public meetings. We are not allowed to hold demonstrations. Any demonstration that, that criticizes the government any demonstration that uh, shows that uh, as for rights, the, the enforcement of rights, that we're envious of Malawi, that they're able to hold public, meet, public demonstrations for, for one year. In Zambia, that's not allowed. The opposition cannot hold a public demonstration. They cannot hold a, a, any protest of any kind. The police warn, warn demonstrators way in advance that if you are going to do that, we'll arrest you and we'll shoot you, we'll do all kinds of things to stop you. Uh, so what, what is happening here, the, the, the civil society is so afraid to do anything that, uh, that challenges the state. So it has individualized the, the, the protest. So you find that a few people like him, Laura Mitty, my young sister, you know, are able to talk, but they are isolated as individuals. So even if they speak on behalf of their organizations, they, they're actually individualized. So we have individualized protests because protests involving mass, people, mass, mass movements don't, are not possible. A few who turn up to a, to a demonstration will all be arrested in a lockdown. So the issue of numbers is important, but I think if there's anything to learn from Malawi is how you, you are able to do that. Because when you have a militarized system where the police acts with instructions and make sure that they don't reason, uh, they make sure that they don't, you don't meet, I think it becomes very difficult. Lastly, let me talk about uh, the, the, the issue of um, um, uh, electoral justice, the, the dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. I think a free and fair election is one where uh, losers will go to a court for adjudication, uh, where those people with grievances will take them to a court of law. In Zambia, our courts seem not to actually act on behalf of the public. Uh, cases that involve the head of state, that involve the, the state, that involve uh, incumbents, ministers, and so forth, have always been decided in, in favor of the government. It, it, it cannot be possible that uh, 
in all cases, the government is right. That, that's, that's not possible. That's not justice. Because the, the law is there. But people go to court because they believe they can win the case. So we have a case now whereby, uh, of course, the president's legibility is being challenged. Um, everybody knows what the outcome will be, way in advance. Um, and that's, 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 that's unfair. But the other thing is that it takes a long time to decide cases. You know, some cases that were started in uh, 20, 2016, I think they took almost two years to be decided. So again, we go into this election, if I conclude, uh, one does not see, see that we go to a free and fair election. Um, I think I, 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 I would like to co concur uh, with the first speaker that uh, uh, the conditions for a free and fair election don't exist in Zambia today. Uh, and, and if you talk about rigging, I think it has already taken place because uh, the voters' role has, has questionable integrity. Um, and it's already clear that uh, certain, uh, you know, the, the, the voting, the, the, the voters, the, voter, the register shows that uh, in areas where, in regions where the, 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 the ruling party um, has strongholds, uh, the ECZ, or the Electoral Commission of Zambia, or registered more people there, and there are fewer people that have been registered uh, in the opposition area. So there's an inbuilt majority has already been uh, factored in. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. We can come back to discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me um, in thanking all our presenters, our panelists uh, these days, because we can't even clap and we can say halala in all our discussions. Very enriching debate, lots to talk about, lots to cover. Um, uh, our convener, my brother, um, Dr. Mandaza, how do we proceed with your questions? Um, can, you, can you just assist me? Um, has anyone collected the questions? I see there are chats here, but I don't know whether we have questions. Um, Dr. Uh, Mandaza? I think we have, we have just one hand there, Tony Rila. And I think we take uh, uh, Tony, Rila, uh, Tony Rila, and then we have, uh, I think we can start winding up. Uh, the purpose of having the discussions was precisely to do that, to have the discussion. So I think we have achieved that purpose, but uh, we take the hands that are there. So far, there's only one hand. And there are no more hands. I would ask that you, you just ask them, the main panelists to sum up in a minute each or something. And then your good self okay. wind up before I close the session. Thanks, Benz. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Questions. Uh, whoever has a question, please tell tell us to whom that question is directed. Uh, thank you. That I, 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 that was an extremely rich discussion, and I, I want to go back to one of the points that you made yourself, Madam Chair. And that was the issue about observation. Um, and I want to link that to the context that Zikamai posed at the beginning, because you raised the issue that observation is a double-edged sword. It can help and it can hinder. Um, so observation, in my view, is a very big risk. Um, and what comes with observation is quite clearly political interest, international political interest. And as you can see recently, uh, the AU has ducked on the issue of whether the coup in Mali was a coup or not. And that was the case uh, also with Zimbabwe. So what international observation in my view brings is a debate between stability and democracy. And so, that's a very important thing because when you observe an election, international observers often do not have the uh, intimate understanding of the local context. That local context, for example, in Zimbabwe was uh, outlined by Professor Jonathan Moyo in his book on Exelgate and what happened in Exelgate. So my point about observation is that when we listen to all the conditions that Tsukamai pointed out, that should be present before the vote and even during the vote. If those, and particularly if the preconditions are not present prior to the vote, why does one observe? Because this is a very, very dangerous thing to do. Um, 
uh, NDI did this in 2000, where they said the pre preconditions for the election in Zimbabwe were not right for the holding of a democratic election. And they were vilified by all international groups as saying you're prejudging the outcome. But what they were doing was judging the process that I think that every speaker has spoken about today. If the conditions are not right, and here we speak about the integrity that you spoke about, is delimitation care clear? Is uh, printing and allocation of uh, the ballot clear? Is the voting verification and counting clear? Is the overall count and what does that count mean? Does the count have to wait for some final body or is when the result is uh, announced at a polling station for a constituency, that's a valid result and everybody can report that. Those are really critical conditions. Now, prior to that particular process of voting, if the conditions are not clear, why do you observe? Because when you do, what you're able to say is very limited. What you can say is that uh, people registered, people voted, an election was held, a result happened, somebody won, and then the internal dispute must take care of those things. And what fundamentally happens in these deeply manipulated elections is a government that is basically de facto in a short matter of months becomes de jure. And therefore the stability argument wins over everything else. And that makes a complete farce out of elections. And in my view, that's what we've witnessed very extensively since 2000. So this is a, a general comment, but I would be interested in you picking up on your own comment that observation is a very serious matter and must be done with deep seriousness. And if it's not done properly, what it does is basically validate invalid elections. Thank you. And thank you to everybody else who presented tonight. Well, thank you very much. I, I cannot agree more with you um, that uh, observation, I, I'm no longer even sure if we need election observers. It could be that probably there will, people have heard, I've heard people say that uh, their presence uh, mitigates violence. But for what I, from what I have seen, and, and particularly, and I'm particularly talking about observers from a multi, multilateral organizations, you know, um, and there's the whole issue of di diplomacy of, of brotherhood and, and, and all that. And, and, and maybe we, we have passed that point, uh, and as I said, on the continent, that the time has come for us to look each other in the eyes and tell each other the truth. So I agree with you. And it's not only stability versus democracy that we are seeing. We're also seeing human rights versus economic development. development. We're, we're reaching a stage where the human rights uh, uh, record of a country doesn't matter. A country can kill people, they can oppress people, suppress freedom of expression, freedom of association, all the fundamental rights. That doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as that country uh, is developing economically, it, be, it becomes a shining beacon and, and, and its human rights record uh, doesn't matter. And this is what is, is, is developing and that's a trend that really worries me, particularly on the continent. Some of the countries which I will not mention that I worked in with very bad human rights records, but they're doing well economically and they become a beacon of, beacon of hope for all of us. So I think the need to balance between stability, democracy, human rights and economic development. And we know all of us that even in the human rights um, instruments, you said you can never have development without human rights. I think let me give the panelists one minute each. We have eight minutes to go uh, before we half past and so that we can then um, close the session in the order in which um, they have spoken. Please, one minute each. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I generally do agree with what my fellow panelists have observed. 
Um, I wanna close with putting emphasis on what Gift said, creating people power. And he says creating people power is only possible when ordinary citizens are part of the movement. And I think this is, this is very, very important. He emphasizes that empowering citizens, not as a project, but as a process. <clears throat> and this is also, I think, uh, related to uh, what Mr. Anud Tsunga mentioned around citizen observers, uh, broad best, creating broad based organic monitoring and protection of the vote. <clears throat> and I think this concept is linked to how we choose to model um, civil society approaches uh, to elections. Um, so there's a concept that I call civil society elitism, and we really need to deal with that. Um, whether we, we choose to be a professional activist generation or to act as you know, real agents for citizens. Uh, and this is linked to a conversation that I'm desperate to have, maybe not here, maybe some, some other time, maybe to encourage uh, the facilitators, the conveners. This is the conversation about money and elections. And it touches different aspects. Um, how really money has been influencing the direction of elections um, and how we as, as citizen groups respond to it um, in many ways, because elections are also a big business. Um, we're talking about observing elections and all those. So there's a lot of money that goes into civil society. There's a lot of money that goes into business. There's a lot of money that goes into political actors. And it's very important that we have uh, this conversation and if there is a way, because really you can't have much impact when the money is not there. But it's very important that we design ways in which the money does not influence our approaches and we are able to continue to play the role that we can play. But we also, we need to unpack the cartel power with the election. So I'm going to uh, put a link in the chat chair on how an example of how money and the cartel power has been part of this. And I imagine a situation in which we can build a citizen movement that is able to fund itself and to be able to participate in elections in ways that are not influenced by uh, big money. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm putting the link uh, in the chat. Thank you, Chair. Those are my, my last words. Um. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I can come in. Yes. Uh, thank you yes, very please. much, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to end uh, by emphasizing to that elections are impossible to protect um, unless the people want to and are empowered to. Um, Oppressive uh, regimes are very good at ignoring civil society, especially when they can frame it as elitist and speaking for foreign agents. And, uh, it's, and, and, and simply civil society just does not have the power to prevent uh, the stealing of an election. And in dealing with, uh, or, or in looking at what we consider people power, it's very important not to leave gaps so I think like in the case of Zambia, the problem might even be that what was left out this time was a rural vote. So yes, you, you, you can see that in the um, urban centers and those on, on, on social media are vocal and know what they want. But right now, the rigging seems to be happening, first of all, by massive, massive vote buying in the, in the rural areas, you know, from headmen to chiefs to everybody, a vehicle for every chief in the country and that kind of thing. But that is about a gap, a gap, uh, I think, in what we consider the people. And so in trying to defend elections, we have to start right at the beginning of a, of a new term, whether that ter term has been worn fairly or not, because that's when rigging starts. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Gift. Is Gift on the, still on the line? Yeah, uh, I think my last words um, okay. uh, that I think the, the issue of uh, partnership, collaboration, or using multisectoral strategies is very important. Because a civil society, the challenge that we have always faced is that when you have a weak opposition, I think civil society is supposed to fill that gap. We are facing the very same uh, challenge here uh, in Malawi, where we have a weak opposition, the previous administration. Uh, so as civil society, if we cannot fill uh, that gap, we end up also losing you know, the very same gains in, in terms of the democratic uh, processes, ending up also having a shrinking um, civic space. So as, as civil society, I think we don't need to get tired. We need to use different strategies, including litigation. Uh, the courts should get tired with us. Uh, I think we need also to start talking about um, corruption that is happening in the judiciary. Uh, sometimes we are afraid you know, to confront uh, that reality. I think this is the time that we need you know, to have those strategies so that those leaders who are in those spaces, uh, they begin now to question uh, themselves when they are not you know, independent uh, enough. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me conclude by making a few remarks uh, just on sharing of information that uh, in South Africa we are entering a new era insofar as the influence of money in politics. Uh, it's, um, as, uh, as far as that is concerned, because for the first time, we have a local government election that is coming in October, if it will, it will proceed. Uh, we have a new uh, party funding act that uh, forces a political party to disclose their private sources of funding. We'll see how that works, but closely tied to that is the amendment to the, to the legislation called Promotion of Access to Information Act. That act has been amended to include political parties in the definition of um, private bodies, which means that citizens and anyone can request information, any information from political parties. And uh, failure to comply with an uh, information request in terms of this, the, the, the new act will attract sanctions and those sanctions are going to be applied by the organization that I, I lead, which is the information regulator. I thought that we'll see how that works in practice, whether it will have an impact at all on the influence of money in politics. But in conclusion, I think I want to say that it appears that COVID has come in very handy for oppressive regimes. I'm saying that because it has given them now the right openly to restrict fundamental rights and freedoms under the guise of the management of the spread of COVID. We have seen that uh, uh, free campaigning will be affected, freedom of association, freedom, um, freedom of assembly is affected uh, because the, we have to practice social distancing, um, controlling the social media, uh, under the guise of containing fake news that will contain the spread of COVID. Uh, because of COVID, there is now open surveillance because there is the whole issue of contact tracing of people who have uh, been in contact with those who have tested positive. So we are going to be running an election or the election is going to be held within that environment. And 
I began by saying over and above all the challenges that we have had and we continue to have in the management of elections, we now have this monster called COVID, which not only affects our health, but it's, I think it's going to take us back in terms of human rights and democracy because it is now used to unfairly and unreasonably uh, limit rights. I think I'm, I'm, I'm honored, uh, my brother Ibo, for inviting me. Lots of issues. I mean, we, we need the whole day to talk about all the issues that have been brought, but this is just the beginning. And as Nzinga Mai has said, I think the issue of the influence of money in politics is something that requires a discussion on its own. Thank you very much. And I'm handing back to you, uh, Dr. Mandaza. Thanks, Penzi. Thanks so much. Uh, before I thank you formally, just to, to, not to try and sum up, but just to underline the question, are the conditions in place for free and fair elections in 2023 in Zimbabwe? I think that has been answered. And perhaps just underline it, uh, we have seen from Malawi in particular, but also from Zambia, the role of civil society uh, in creating or in monitoring and ensuring the that elections are free and fair. And raises the question on the other hand of the situation in Zimbabwe and, and, um, and, and the role of civil society in a military situation, in a situation where elections, especially since 2000, have been run by the security military establishment. As is shown in the Excel gate, the, the role of the security Security military establishment cannot be under underestimated, and and also the violence that took place in, in 2018, and indeed the expectations that violence will be even more serious in 2023, and indeed our next our next discussion on the 24th is therefore on organised violence and torture during elections in Zimbabwe. Will this be repeated in 2023 and how to prevent it? All this underlines what Tika Mai Beda said. We should temper, we should be careful about any euphoria about elections. And I think the election industry needs to self introspect and consider very seriously the question. Are conditions in place for free and fair elections in Zimbabwe in 2023? Again, I thank you. A particular thanks to all the panelists. Tikama uh, Bere, Laura, Gift, Ellen, Ngay, and Neo. Thank you very much. And above all, our moderator, Pansy. Uh, our choice of you as our moderator for this important discussion uh, have not been misplaced at all. On the contrary, I think you've begun a conversation. You've raised issues in your right, the power of money, the role of observ observers, and indeed the quest for democracy and ensuring that elections are run properly. It has been part of your own obsession uh, professionally. And I hope that we will again join us in such discussions as we've had today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all and good night.
Yeah. 